Hello, I'm Jerry Flegel, President and CEO of the Foundation, and we're so glad you could join us this afternoon. Welcome to our first virtual program of the year, exclusively for members and donors of the Hoover Presidential Foundation. We are so grateful for your continued support during the last year. You stuck with us through the pandemic and then the derecho. Hopefully that's the end of the drama as we look forward to 2021 to be an outstanding year with lots of exciting events to come. Again, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, the Foundation staff, and everyone who works on the Hoover campus, we sincerely thank you and couldn't carry on without you. As I mentioned before, we all appreciate our members and donors a great deal, and we wanted to put together a program exclusively for you. I'd like to encourage you to regularly check our website and Facebook page, as well as those on the library and the historic site for special program offerings that will pop up in the months ahead. In fact, we have online programs every month for you to enjoy, including our regular third Thursday program tonight at 6 p.m. There's still time to register for that on our website. It's about the origins of the presidential cabinet with Dr. Lindsay Trubinsky. I also wanna tell you about two other programs that we have coming up in the next few months. First, we're accepting nominations for the Uncommon Public Service Award amongst our state legislators. The Uncommon Public Service Award was created to honor those public servants who demonstrate uncommon service to the people of Iowa above and beyond their legislative responsibilities. Just visit our website under the Grants and Award tab to enter your nominations for a state representative or a state senator or both. And the deadline is March 1st. The other program I wanted to tell you about is especially exciting because we will deliver over $60,000 in scholarship funding to 15 Iowa high school juniors who create and run a community service oriented project of their own design next year. The 15 finalists will earn $1,500 and four of those will earn an additional $10,000 scholarship each. It's called the Uncommon student awards, and it's only for Iowa high school juniors who apply by March 15th. You can also find details under the grants and awards tab on our website or visit uncommonstudent.org for more details. I hope you'll tell everyone you know about these two great programs. As for this program, we invite you to enter questions at any time during the program through the Q&A feature you'll find along the edge of your screen. You may also vote for questions someone else has entered if you'd also like to hear those answered, as we might not have time to answer all the questions provided. Top vote getters will get asked first. Now today's presentation is called The President's First 100 Days. The timing is perfect as we now are in day two of a new Joe Biden presidency, and our host will walk us through some things that we might expect in comparison with Herbert Hoover's transitions in and out of the White House. And leading the discussion today is one of President Hoover's great-granddaughters, Margaret Hoover. You may have seen her hosting her PBS series, Firing Line, or as a political commentator on your favorite network news channels, or in West Branch during Hoover's hometown days every August. Joining Margaret is Hoover biographer and historian, Dr. George Nash, and John Avalon, senior political analyst and anchor at CNN. A warm welcome to each of you. Margaret, as you get started, could you tell us a little bit about maybe your connections to our, your co-presenters? We're not picking up your audio, Margaret. How's that? How's that? Yep. There we go. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, well, thank you very much, Jerry, and thank you everybody who is on the line and watching. It's a it's a wonderful to be here with all of you. And I actually, as we discussed talking about the first hundred days and presidential transitions, thought it wouldn't it would be so much better to have this conversation with George Nash, who is 
truly the world's leading authority on the life of President Herbert Hoover. And, and then another historian who I happen to know reasonably well, uh, John Avalon, my husband and beloved, the father of my children and the love of my life, who also happens to be uh, also a published author uh, with an expertise, uh, particularly in George Washington. And he is also currently uh, writing a book about Abraham Lincoln and uh, Abraham Lincoln's uh, last five weeks in the presidency prior to his uh, tragic assassination. So in that, in that context, we have transitions sort of at the front of mind. And I invited, uh, we thought we would invite uh, Dr. Nash um, and John Avalon to discuss not just presidential transitions in the first 100 days, but to really put it in historic context um, with a real focus on a project that Dr. Nash is working on right now, which is a special treatment of that interregnum period, that transition period between 1932 and 1933 when Herbert Hoover and uh, handed over the presidency to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So without further ado, we're just going to dive right in. We want to let you know that we'll have a, a guided conversation for about um, 35 minutes or so. And please, if you have questions as we go, as Jerry said, put them in the Q&A queue. And by the end, I think we'll tick, I'll tick through them in a, in a guided way. And um, I don't know if I'll be able to open up the floor to somebody to ask them, or I'll just credit the person who asked the question in the queue, and uh, we'll let George and John field those questions um, as it goes, and me if there are any for me. Um, so, so without further ado, we're going to start, and I think I think it's appropriate to first begin with the very first president to offer a transition. John Avalon, you wrote a book called Washington's Farewell and is I about, right here. I know, but I'm going to talk in the screen, see, oh. because if I talk, <laughs> it's awkward, then, like, then it's like we're talking. But if I look in the screen, then people feel like we're all part of a conversation it. together. It's a little <laughs> trick with broadcasting. <laughs> um, so, so you wrote this book called Washington's Farewell, which is actually about Washington, George Washington's farewell address. You can look at me in the screen too, really and then weird. people will feel yeah. like we're part of the same conversation. Okay. okay. <laughs> you notice the morning show hosts never look at each other. They look at That's the screen when they talk to each other. <laughs> um, but Washington's farewell address, which you, I, I want you to tell us more about it, but just to set the table, uh, was actually the invitation for a first peaceful transition of power, right? right? This was uh, a not actually an address that was given. It was a newspaper. It was a speech that was printed in a newspaper. And it was actually the thing, the place where George Washington announced that he would peaceably step down from power right. voluntarily. And that set off this tradition of peaceful transitions of power. So I think it's only fitting we begin there. Uh, what did the founders have in mind? And what did Washington in particular have in mind? for future generations when it came to uh, the peaceful transition of power? Well, Margaret. No. <laughs> um, see, by the way, in, in the world of Zoom seminars, you don't get people in the same room much. I know, so we were going to have dynamic, them in another room. Which is weird. Kind of weird. Anyway, so let's talk about the founders. So, so when, the, when the Constitution was, was written uh, and being debated in Philadelphia, uh, in 1787. Obviously, you know, they were correcting for the weakness of the Articles in Confederation. They hadn't had a president before. Everyone assumed the president would be Washington. And they had so much trust and faith in him as the leader of the revolution that they basically figured out, they'd set some broad parameters, but he would figure out the specifics. Uh, among the things that was not delineated was presidential terms. Um, president, you know, could serve as many terms as they wanted. And there were debates about how to distinguish him from a king. Um, Washington didn't actually want to run for a second term. He was, he was tired. He wanted to go back to Mount Vernon. This was not simply a Cincinnati pose. It was totally legitimate. But um, everyone warned him that if he left after one term, that the country would fall apart. And it, even Jefferson and Hamilton, who didn't agree on anything, uh, said that if you leave now, we could degenerate into civil war. Uh, so he agreed to run for re-election, and, and incidentally, his second inaugural is one of the worst inaugurals ever written, because you can tell he just doesn't want to be there. It's like 200 words long. Um, but when it comes time, uh, by the end of his second term, the country really has stabilized. It has cohered. Um, but still, there was no precedent for a peaceful transfer of power. There was no precedent for giving up power. And so Washington worked on a farewell address in secret, writing it with Alexander Hamilton. Those of you who are fans of the musical Hamilton, the song One Last Time. Uh, 
dramatically reenacts and uses some of the language from the farewell address in that song. Um, but he wrote it as a warning to future generations, wisdom they could take forward about the forces he feared could destroy a democratic republic. Um, Hyperpartisanship, excessive debt, foreign wars, foreign interference in our politics, all very relevant things we're dealing with today. Um, and, and when he published it in a newspaper, it was a major bombshell um, because it, it, it stunned everybody that anyone would leave power voluntarily. And in fact, uh, apocryphally, George III, the king we defeated um, in the Revolutionary War, was told about this by when he was getting his, uh, his portrait painted and said, well, if that's true, he's the greatest man in the history of the world uh, because no one had ever voluntarily given up power. But that's what republics were about, certainly. Uh, the ideals of the ancient Greek and Roman republics. Then, of course, there was an election. Um, his vice president succeeded him. And then the 1800 election was the first really contested election where Jefferson uh, defeats the incumbent president. Um, but that really sets the whole template. Um, and and it, was, um, it, was, it was a revolution within a revolution. Uh, but the peaceful transfer of power was established then. And, of course, that two-term tradition was not written in the Constitution, didn't need to be until FDR... Uh, uh, broke it and abused it, and then uh, Congress decided to rein it in and make it part of the Constitution going forward. You're welcome. George, uh, <laughs> thank you for setting the table. Uh, George, well, as we were uh, going through this yesterday, I, you know, Washington, you're a, obviously a, a, a historian of, of all parts of American history with a specialty on Herbert Hoover, but as we were talking yesterday, you raised this point, right, that, that the, the election of 1800 was the first contested election in American history. Tell yes, first, first contested presidential election, yes. And <clears throat> pardon me, uh, Thomas Jefferson won and um, he defeated John Adams. And they were at that point great rivals and enemies. They later reconciled in their retirement years. And one of the, th the things that uh, Jefferson emphasized in his inaugural address is that we were, we were all Americans. We were all Federalists, we're all Republicans. That was the term for the Jeffersonian party. So he tried to strike a, a theme of national unity and, uh, and not be perceived in the North where he was politically weak as some kind of an ogre or a, uh, a supporter of the French Revolution, which he'd been accused of being and which he to some degree did favor in France. But there was fear that Jefferson might um, go off awry uh, in the United States. So that was a, a key moment when Jefferson struck that unity theme. Uh, and that is one that um, is, is recurred. And of course, uh, I think maybe John will want to say something about this uh, with, uh, with respect to Abraham Lincoln, because his first inaugural occurred at a time when several states had seceded from the Union. So here was the Union uh, breaking up, it appeared. And uh, so there, uh, Lincoln made a kind of an appeal to the better angels of our nature, uh, as I recall Lincoln's expression. So I would, I would just stop there and as we proceed through the history of transitions to point out that I think that the first, uh, with Washington established the template, as John just said, the uh, one to, uh, to Jefferson deepened it because it was a more a uh, disturbing transition from one party to another. And then we have the Lincoln transition, if you will, in 1861, which is um, the prelude to civil war. Yeah, and, and I'll, 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 I'll pick that up a bit because um, that was obviously the most fraught transition in American history by far. Um, seven states announced their intention to secede after Lincoln is elected before the inauguration on March 4th. Um, and, and that interregnum was, was extraordinary long, and, and uh, we'll, we'll talk more about how that got changed in a second. But, um, you know, what, Lincoln represented a breakaway third party, an upstart third party, the Republican Party. The Democrats had splintered and offered uh, two candidates, and the former Whigs offered a third. So it was four people in the field. Lincoln won the election without receiving any votes in the South, where he wasn't on the ballot in many states, and, and without even clearing quite 40 percent of the popular vote. But he won the Electoral College decisively, uh, realigned former Whig voters and, and abolitionists. Uh, but the mere fact and fear of his election, despite the fact he was running not to say he wanted to abolish slavery, but to stop its expansion, um, he was so demonized and attacked by, by, by Southerners and secessionists uh, that that secession effort and, and civil war began before he even took the oath of office. And indeed, Washington 
was, was under military threat. They were concerned that insurrectionists would try to kill him before he took the oath of office. He had to sneak into Washington um, uh, on, on, on the eve of his inauguration. Uh, it was a very fraught time, but one of the reasons for the Civil War, um, obviously, ultimately, it's about secession and slavery, but Lincoln also pointed out it was about establishing that there cannot, there can be no successful appeal from the ballot to the bullet. And, and uh, I, I think a lot of Lincoln's lessons are fairly resonant today. So the transition then, as uh, Lincoln becomes president in 1861, obviously is not a peaceful transition that leads to the Civil War. Uh, and, then, and then you have uh, Johnson, who succeeds Lincoln after Lincoln is assassinated. And then the next, pre the next uh, transition, presidential transition after that, that has some deal of resonance, a little bit of resonance today, George, is this transition between President Johnson and, and Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, one of the things, maybe not, uh, not, not uh, honorably, that we can compare, at least, at least in terms of that inauguration and this past inauguration, 150 years ago, Johnson refused to attend Grant's inauguration. Um, and we had not seen that occurrence until just yesterday uh, when President Trump refused to attend the inauguration of his successor. Uh, what is it and what was it um, around the Johnson Grant transition uh, that made it uh, as contentious? And would you say it was as contentious or, or even more contentious than the transition of 1800? Well, um, what made it particularly um, difficult was that Johnson had succeeded Abraham Lincoln. He was Lincoln's running mate in 1864. He was a man from Tennessee. He was a Southerner. And once Lincoln died, uh, the, uh, Johnson did much to, in effect, appease the defeated Confederate South by uh, taking steps to bring their, their leaders back into um, positions of, of influence if they wanted to be through the exercise of the pardon power. And if I'm not mistaken, um, on Christmas of 1868, uh, by which time Johnson was still president, but it was known that Ulysses Grant, Republican, would come in as president in the following March. On Christmas of 1868, Johnson issued massive pardons to Confederate veterans and others. And that permitted many of those folks to become leaders of the white South during the Reconstruction period that continued under Ulysses Grant. So many Republicans were outraged. They thought that Johnson had betrayed Lincoln's legacy, if you will, and he, he got in because of the assassination, but um, did not pursue policies that the Republicans in the North wanted to uh, impose, if you will, as part of the reconstruction of the seceded, formerly seceded states of the South. So I, I got interested in this a little yesterday because we were hearing so much about possible exercise of the pardon power uh, this time, and it's become something of a tradition for presidents to do this. But as far as I know, the most flagrant uh, use of it uh, and in, in just in sheer numbers was Andrew Johnson's in 1868, early and into early 1869. Yeah, and, and I'll add only two things. Johnson, of course, is the first president to be impeached. Um, and, and, and really one of the most um, offensive uses of the pardon power, I think in presidential history, was as Johnson on his way out the door pardoned people associated with the Lincoln plot. Now, not the core plotters, they were already hung and dead. The Lincoln assassination plot. Correct, the plot to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. So, um, uh, you know, he, he allowed, I think, Booth's body to be returned to his family and pardoned some people on the periphery of, of the plot, which was, was seen as an insult. And, you know, while we hadn't planned to talk about this, we would be remiss in the conversation about transitions to discuss 1876-1877, which was invoked briefly by Ted Cruz. Uh, this election, that's where Sam Tilden, Democrat, um, beat, won the popular vote over uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, governor of Ohio. Um, but there was... Uh, actual fraud in, 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 in four states that were Southern states that hadn't really fully come back in the union. Uh, they formed a commission uh, and ultimately a corrupt bargain was uh, basically set whereby Republicans would hold on to the White House, the cabinet would have Southern Democrats in it, the North would remove union troops from the South and effectively end reconstruction. Um, and, uh, and that was resolved uh, days before inauguration. It was a real constitutional crisis and a uh, pretty lousy legacy. And that came up 
th this actually this incident we should just dwell on this for just two more minutes before we get to where we're actually going with all of this which is the fdr the hoover fdr transition that's right um but but that became relevant and germane to the discussions this time mm -hmm. because uh josh holly and ted cruz and and many many cited uh the fact that actually there is a there was a precedent for contesting the counting the electoral the counting of the electors right in, well, in congress right well it, actually it was a law passed after that fact that is, is is a notoriously not terribly well written or clear law um but but more importantly cruz was saying that they should establish a new sort of uh, commission of the sort that had been uh, set before uh, to to establish any questions of voter fraud and therefore delay the official counting of the electoral votes which had already been certified. As Lindsey Graham and others pointed out, the situations were not remotely similar, and therefore the parallel was was strained and um, illogical, and uh, especially after an attack on the Capitol. George, do you have anything to add there, or or shall we move ahead to 1932? No, well, I think John uh, summed up very well, I and mean, we obviously had a, a period in our uh, history since then, until the 1930s, when presidential transitions did not have that kind of stress. But the next stressful one, really, was the one of 32 to 33, Hoover to Roosevelt. And so we, we've gotten from, we, we got from Washington to Washington through to through Hoover, and we really only have in terms of transitions. Well, eighteen hundred is contentious. Um, eighteen sixty one, uh, you know, is of course violent and leads to the Civil War. But after that, we have a series of peaceful transitions of power that may not hit the highest standards of decorum, but we have soundly established a, a, a habit and a tradition of a peaceful transition of power. So why then? George, what were the characteristics and the elements that made the transition in 1933 uh, so strained between uh, Herbert Hoover and his successor? Well, first of all, there was no question about the outcome of the election of 32. There was no argument about fraud. It was an overwhelming Roosevelt victory, 42 states to just six for Hoover, about 22 million votes for Roosevelt, 15 plus for million plus for Hoover. It was almost a reversal of Hoover's landslide of 1928. But what was uh, making it more stressful was that this was the worst domestic crisis that the United States faced since the Civil War of 18, or the impending Civil War of 1860 61, because of the state of the economy. In other words, the Great Depression. And we, I need now to underscore a point that's already been alluded to by John, and that is that um, through 1932-33, we had what we would now call the old system of transitions, where the president elected in November did not take office until the 4th of the following March. Now, as it happened, uh, Congress uh, enacted and uh, the states ratified a constitutional amendment in 3233 that ended that system and we and put January 20th as the presidential inaugural date going forward but the amendment was not ratified until February of 33 so th they had to operate under the prevailing constitutional rules so it meant for in those dire economic circumstances a very long transition, but that ended, and ever since we've had January 20th as the constitutional date for, for the presidential inaugural. So you had basically four months where a defeated president, who was not merely defeated, but was widely hated and had been decisively defeated, nevertheless had the reins of authority, if not as much influence uh, uh, as, as in the case of Herbert Hoover, and you had a new president coming in who, um, was of the opposite party and he and uh, Hoover had been friends, but that friendship had curdled into a, uh, a rivalry uh, through many steps through the 1920s and into the 30s. And obviously their, their ambitions collided when Hoover wanted to remain in the White House and Roosevelt uh, sought successfully to replace him. So you had personal stresses there, but it was how to deal, <clears throat> pardon me, with the, the economic crisis, which uh, had, reached its depths in the summer of 32. There was a certain amount of economic rallying and recovery in the fall, but not enough to make much impression on the general public, the voting public. There were something like almost one in four Americans uh, unemployed, 
at the time of Roosevelt's accession to the, the White House. There was, and we all know the, the, these sort of data points from our studies of history, there was uh, a deepening crisis then as the winter of 33 uh, wore on. And Hoover reached out to Roosevelt, and we can, you know, I can elaborate if you wish, uh, to try to have some common ground on certain issues that were arising during the, the, the changeover, the interregnum as it came to be called. Some of this had to do with how to deal with foreign policy matters, notably the vast debts that European nations still owed us after World War I, how to handle those, and then the domestic policies uh, which culminated in the banking crisis of February and March of 33. So the stresses came uh, from the structural na nature of the transition, the length of it, from the intensity of the economic uh, depression, and from the fact that Hoover and Roosevelt were not merely rivals, but uh, were, were enemies effectively at that point. Can I just interject one point there, George, because um, I I'm fascinated and I'm really looking forward to you explaining to folks uh, the nature of Hoover's reaching out to FDR and what that was about. But I think it's also worth just pointing out, and forgive me again for interrupting, but that Hoover reached out immediately, as soon as the election was over, to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, fired off a telegram to him, uh, which was in effect his concession. There were not concession speeches, there were not calls, but he said, uh, congratulated him by telegram the morning after the election. President Hoover wished President Roosevelt that his administration would be successful, and he pledged, quote, in the common purpose of all of us, I shall dedicate myself to every possible effort. So even in the context of a strained transition, George, uh, there was still, it seemed, some decorum, at least, between the, the, the victor and the vanquished uh, in a way that, that um, was at least true to the, um, the, the sort of elevated nature of the presidency up to that point. Yes, a, a good point. And um, it's worth elaborating a little bit on that very moment. Um, there is anecdotal evidence that, um, that Hoover had something in mind when he uh, issued that statement, that telegram. Uh, he told his doctor, the White House physician, Dr. Joel Boone, it's in Boone's memoir and, and oral history, that he, Hoover, wanted to do something remarkable during that period. He was going to offer his successor an easy transition and try to cooperate with him and smooth the way. And he, uh, it was a very idealistic uh, sounding um, effort that he was going to make. Now, a couple things happened. Like a day or two after that, the British and uh, French governments, followed quickly by other European governments, announced that they were no longer eager to pay their installments on the multi-billion dollar debts that collectively the European countries still owe to the United States as a result of loans that we made to help them win World War I. And this, uh, they had, there had been a moratorium that Herbert Hoover had proposed and promulgated in 31 that was to ease the world economy and get these burdens on the back burner for a while. Uh, so the payments were suspended for a time, but the time was the, it was expiring, the, uh, the, the year of moratorium. And so Hoover suddenly had what appeared to be a considerable foreign crisis on his plate. And the British and French were supposed to pay their next installment uh, in, on December 15th during the transition. And there's some suspicion that they waited to know the outcome of the election and figured they'd have maximum leverage if they um, made this announcement at that particular moment. So Hoover gets his... In, California when he concedes. He's out there to vote on November 8th, 32. So uh, he then gets this notice that uh, suddenly the Europeans are stirring. So uh, Hoover gets back to Washington, I think, or maybe he wasn't even all the way back. Uh, I'd have to just check very carefully the itinerary of this. And he sends Roosevelt a telegram around November 12th or 13th saying that uh, this issue has been raised and I'd like to, in short, meet with you about it. Now that was an unprecedented act, it, it is believed by historians in American history. It was one thing to say, I will cooperate with you in general terms and so on, but now there is a specific issue that has arisen that the incumbent president does not feel he can adequately 
address because he's just been defeated and repudiated by the public and he wants to involve Roosevelt and get him up to speed and set up a, 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 a a, a, a joint kind of policy. It's almost like proposing an effect, a, a, a coalition government arrangement of sort on a certain issue. It was something quite outside the realm of American practice. Roosevelt is immediately suspicious because he wonders whether tr Hoover is trying to entangle him in some matters uh, here. Is this a good faith offer of cooperation? So Roosevelt replies and says, yes, I'll come down to the White House, which he did on November 22nd, and they had a meeting. And he said, though, I want it to be wholly private and informal, words to that effect. In other words, he wasn't coming there to make some formal deal or arrangement. And Roosevelt took the position, which he consistently maintained for the next three or four months, that he was not the president of the United States. The president had the constitutional authority to do what he felt he needed to do. And Roosevelt was still governor. He left that at the beginning of January and became a private citizen. So he, Roosevelt, did not want uh, to be involved in giving uh, and taking part in this. So they, they did not come to terms. And it's a long, complicated story, and I won't try to go through the ins and outs of it further. But um, they failed to have a rapprochement on that point. And very quickly, Hoover began to suspect that Roosevelt was playing games, that uh, he was not cooperating in good faith. Roosevelt suspected Hoover of trying to entangle him. Hoover wanted to set up a joint commission to address the Europeans. He would offer Roosevelt some seats on it. And Roosevelt said, well, I'm private party here. I can't run the policy. Roosevelt's view he wasn't, was that he wasn't going to take uh, any stand that would commit him to anything uh, after March 4th until he took the oath of office. But the crisis was there on the front burner, and it metastasized in other respects. They had another meeting in January of 33, and uh, it increasingly became a matter where mutual distrust uh, prevented any satisfactory arrangement. And there are several layers to this, which I can add on, but let me stop there. And if you have a follow up or John has a comment. No, so, so that's great. I mean, I think what's interesting, so what, what you're saying is what's notable is that you have a, a, a defeated president who continues to be the president for this four month period. Uh, in, an, in a global financial economic crisis, trying to work with his successor in order to bring stability to the global markets and the domestic financial markets and too much distrust between them to be able to agree on a course of action. Uh, now the story and the telling that I have been told and that I have read about at length and perhaps you're leading us here is the the succession of events that led to Hoover, uh, led to uh, pre precipitated the failing of the banks uh, in just the days before the inauguration in the United States. And Hoover's very earnest and serious pleas to Roosevelt to cooperate to send a joint message in order to stabilize the financial markets and prevent them from failing. Uh, and is it is it fair, George? You're a historian. Um, I'm a Hoover partisan, but but it, I, as I've read from other historians who are historians, not Hoover partisans, uh, that that Hoover's hope was that Roosevelt would cooperate to be able to send a message that would offer stability to the markets, and that Roosevelt was more interested in in. Uh, ensuring that he won the politics of the moment rather than uh, the, the the policy outcome that would have stabilized the markets is that is that a fair characterization? I'm trying to be delicate. Okay, well, uh, let me just say that uh, this this crisis was in two phases, and the one that I just addressed a moment ago was the foreign policy phase. And uh, Hoover Secretary of State Henry Stimson, who later became Roosevelt's Secretary of War in World War II. Um, Hoover Secretary of State Stimson went up to Hyde Park and discussed things over with, uh, with uh, uh, Roosevelt as a kind of emissary from Hoover in January of 33. And the net of all of that foreign policy uh, aspect was that um, the, the issue was placed in, in Roosevelt's lap. Uh, but he uh, had said, uh, 
to uh, the press after I think his first meeting with Hoover, well, that's not my baby. And mm -hmm. that got reported in November. And that was a signal to some of his critics in the press, and he got criticized for that, that he was being at best nonchalant about an issue that was pressing in. But to make a long, very long story short, uh, the foreign policy crisis receded, uh, obviously, as the days went by, uh, the, Roosevelt was getting closer to the, to the presidency, and Roosevelt met the British ambassador, I think, at Warm Springs, Georgia, in late January, and they had a nice chat and all of that, and so forth. So Hoover didn't get what he wanted. He wanted a commission to address this issue. There's one other layer to this that we need to keep in mind, and that is, Hoover's interpretation of the economic issue at hand was that it was in being intensified by European actions, notably Britain going off the gold standard. Hoover wanted to restore the gold standard and saw this negotiation over war debts as a step toward managing that. Roosevelt had run on the grounds and argued that Hoover was using an alibi. He was trying to blame uh, his, his um, shortcomings as president, as, as Roosevelt saw them, his, uh, the fact that the economy wasn't improving, he was trying to blame it all on Europe. And Roosevelt in the campaign said that was the boldest alibi in history. Roosevelt wanted to concentrate on domestic policy, and he didn't want his hands tied. And he thought that Hoover was trying to tie his hands. Now, increasingly, you get now to the banking element, which is the second wave of this interlocking set of crises, which really um, comes to a head in February of 33. Can I just ask you a quick question to wrap up the, the foreign policy stages of this? I mean, it seems extraordinary that an incoming president would reach out his hand to his successor who has beaten him at the polls and that that successor would say, yeah, no, 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 I don't want to any, I don't want to start yet. <laughs> like, you know, I'm not interested. Yes. Well, okay. uh, it's hard to imagine. I mean, if, if Donald Trump had done that to Joe Biden, it's hard to imagine Joe Biden would have said, no, 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 it's okay. I'll just wait. Actually, it was the opposite. You know, it, <laughs> huh? The what opposite. Was, what was the opposite? Biden wanted assistance and transition, and they refused to share transition information on the pandemic. But normally, right, normally, at least the precedent in, in recent years, at least the last 30 or 40 years, is that the incoming president is, is offered most considerations, but never an opportunity to shape policy early. That's right. That is really remarkable. And, and Hoover took the initiative, but as I indicated before, Roosevelt thought that Hoover was trying to uh, trap him into um, public policies or, or abjuring certain policies that uh, would tie Roosevelt's hands. Now, a couple of things are on Roosevelt's mind. Uh, one is that he's facing a, a new radically left-wing, more left-wing Congress. Again, uh, this is another it's a little bit of complexity, but maybe the listeners here will appreciate this. This was the last of the arrangements under the Constitution whereby the Congress elected in 1932 would not come into serving in Washington until December of 33 unless the president called them into special session, which Roosevelt eventually did in March of 33. So the Congress was coming back into session during this four months, but what Congress was it? It was the Congress that had just lost the election. There were something like 150 members of the House and Senate who had been defeated for re-election, but they are now a, a major part of the Congress that is meeting from December 32, under Hoover until March 4, 33, when it becomes history. So Roosevelt was very conscious that the Democratic Party had factions, some of which were more conservative than he, and which he thought were probably trying to, you know, perhaps steer him in their direction. So Roosevelt did what he liked to do, smile and say nothing and keep people guessing or drop hints and so on. He was trying to build a cabinet. There's no office of the president elect and so forth. It's all kind of ad hoc at that point in, in those days. So Roosevelt has a, an incentive. I'm not saying it was, a, it was a, a noble motive, but he has an incentive to not do much until he feels he can run the show. 
Mm -hmm. I see. You'll have <laughs> much more liberal Congress to run the show with when he calls it into special session in March of 33. So that jams that with everything you see in the meantime. That does make a lot of sense, actually, when you, when you understand the dynamics that the Congress was entirely different. It was a lame duck Congress that had no loyalty to him and that he was to have no power over when he took office. It does uh, maybe not excuse him, but at least help us understand why he was so utterly unhelpful. Um, so take us to the banking crisis. Well, then, in the first hundred days. And, and, well, let's go to the, the banking crisis and then we'll get to the next, the first hundred days, right? Um, because there were two crises uh, in the interregnum period. And the second one is, was the collapse of the banks, where Hoover reached out specifically to Roosevelt over the course of a 10-day period, uh, asking for uh, just a statement, a, a joint statement, as I recall, George, uh, that would put the markets at ease. Uh, what happened there? Well, the, the bank collapse began um, in earnest uh, in February. There had been bank instability, uh, something like one in five of the banks of the United States had closed in 1930, 31, and 32. That's how bad it was. Uh, and um, I think I have a statistic here. There were over 5,000 bank failures in the United States in 1930, 31, and 32. Wow. So it was it, it just, it, and there's no federal deposit insurance, by the way. We don't get that till 1934. So it's it's a, a very uh, strange and and uh, and uh, frightening period for many people. Well, for reasons that we don't, probably don't have time to go into, the snowball starts rolling faster downhill in February, and it reaches a a turning point on February 14th because of one of the leading banks of Detroit is about to collapse. That mm -hmm. is, it won't have enough money to pay out to the nervous depositors the next day. And there was a whole lot of intrigue involved, and Herbert Hoover was desperately trying to keep this from happening. But the governor of, of Michigan stepped in about 2 o'clock in the morning on Valentine's Day, I think, in 1933, and closed not just the bank that was going to collapse if it opened its doors a few hours later, but every single bank in the entire state of Michigan, 550 banks. So suddenly you have about 3 million people in Michigan without a banking system. That gets people upset. Not just a few people here and there with occasional bank failures that cause inconvenience locally, but now you've got the industrial capital or one of them in the United States, the auto capital. If it can happen in Detroit, if it can happen in Michigan, what about my deposits? So increasingly in the coming days all over the country, you start to see runs on the banks. What does that mean? There's no deposit insurance, so you better get there fast and pull out your $100 in life savings or whatever it might be before the banks run out of money. And so it reaches a climax basically, literally on March 4th of 33. By March 3rd, Hoover, Herbert Hoover's last full day in office, most of the banks in the United States are closed and the rest of the, just about follow suit overnight. So on the 18th of February, Hoover writes a handwritten letter to Roosevelt, who's in New York, basically saying the situation is increasingly desperate. I want your help and so forth. Uh, but Hoover does one thing that apparently upset or angered Roosevelt. Hoover said that he, Hoover's view of this collapse was it is being brought on because business people and investors are afraid of the coming of the New Deal. So it is fear of the unknown or fear of the New Deal, which looked like it might involve going off the gold standard, maybe having funny money inflation, radical democratic schemes and so forth. So in Hoover's view, the, the cause of it, or one of the principal causes of the accelerating collapse of the banks is that people are, are, are scared. And there is some truth to this in that international investors, many of them, started withdrawing their, their money from American accounts in the form of gold. Because if the dollar was devalued, well, they'd rather have a bar of gold than to have deflated or inflated and more worthless dollars. So there is a run on the gold, uh, on gold in those final weeks. There's also at the more everyday level of, of average Americans, uh, uh, just a growing fear that the banks are insecure. So they've got to, they start rushing around to pull their money out. So you've got <clears throat> two things happening at once, both of which weaken the banks. Hoover desperately pleads to, to Roosevelt for action. But he says in his argument or his plea that uh, he wants Roosevelt to um, support the gold standard, a balanced budget, and sort of conservative economics. And Roosevelt 
doesn't want to commit himself to doing that because he's already thinking of abandoning the gold standard and doing things that Hoover thought would be just ter terribly deleterious to the national economy. So what does Roosevelt do? He doesn't answer the letter and later claims lamely, lamely that his secretary had misplaced the draft or whatever. So it takes a second letter from Hoover, I think on the 28th of February, 10 days later, as all this is happening, is saying, please, please, can you issue a statement? And at that point, I think it's about at that point, Roosevelt does reply, apologizes for the misplaced letter that he didn't send. But Roosevelt thought that Hoover's letter was cheeky. Cheeky, as he said. In other words, he thought Hoover had been rather overbearing in the 18th of February appeal. So again, the distrust sets in. Roosevelt doesn't answer. He answers belatedly. By then, the crisis is worse. And Hoover wants Roosevelt to say something, make a joint statement, whatever. Roosevelt says, mere words aren't going to stop this now. And that's Roosevelt's retort. Uh, and he says, you have the power as president to close the banks or issue a proclamation forbidding the transfer of gold out of the United States. And then there's just, there gets to be this whole discussion, well, does the president have the authority to do that? Well, there was an obscure, never repealed World War I law, Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917, that seemed to give authorization if you stretched a point. But Hoover's attorney general said, that's dubious. And um, so Hoover didn't quite want to go to close all the banks, but he wanted, he felt that anything he said or did might be repudiated by the new Congress or uh, it would just be ineffectual because he's on the way out. He wants Roosevelt to, to kind of do it together. And Roosevelt just says, no, it's, you have the authority, you do what you want to wish. And there is an element of political calculation in Roosevelt here, I think, that he did not want to be associated with a president who is losing esteem and losing power that would hurt him with the Congress. It wouldn't make him popular with the people. Also, I think Roosevelt probably came to feel, it's hard to prove, it's a question of motive, but many people, have uh, historians and some of Roosevelt's own associates felt that in the last week or so before he was inaugurated, he felt that it would be better for everything just to fall apart so that he could come in and then say nothing to fear but fear itself and get people to rally around him. In other words, he could come in, the man, the proverbial white horse, and be the hero. So there is that, that element which Hoover senses too. Or, and Hoover said later that this was an induced hysteria of bank depositors and a wholly unnecessary panic. He felt that the panic could have been stopped by Roosevelt joining him. Roosevelt said, I'm a private citizen. You have the power. Go do what you want to do. The odd thing is that the night before the, he was inaugurated, I think it was, Someone said to Roosevelt, well, what are you going to do when you get in? He said, well, I'm going to close the banks, of course. So he, he had concluded that he'd do the same thing, but he was not going to do it with Hoover jointly. And what you can say that's a matter of principle, uh, or it's a matter of calculation, or it's a matter of more than calculation, just saying, well, I think I can benefit if things are at their worst possible state when I come into office. So, I'm, I'm going to call it rash partisan politics at the expense of the American people and the American <laughs> financial markets. And so, I think Ray Boley, uh, you know, FDR speechwriter who went on to be a conservative columnist in Newsweek, I think agreed with your assessment and, and George's uh, later on. Um, and that's about as close to the horse's mouth as you can get. Yeah, moldy. FDR's brilliance, though, is to call it a bank holiday. Um, you know, it's part of that, that veneer uh, of, of, that, that he, he was able to, to put on what would have been the exact same action Hoover had been recommending a few weeks before. Absolutely. And there's another irony here, John and, and, and Margaret. Um, the, the technical legislation, proclamation and, and so forth to bring this about was done by Hoover holdovers at the Department of the yes. So when, when Hoover, when Roosevelt proclaimed the bank holiday, it was initially, I think, for three days, and then it was extended until about a week. And when the banking legislation that Congress passed quickly and overwhelmingly, when it was back, the new Congress was there to do it in the first week of March, uh, that was basically the legislation that had been framed by the technocrats and others in the Republican administration. And um, so... You, uh, you have that sort of irony of history that the yeah. did what they could. 
So before we get to uh, you know this this uh, configuration that has become the first hundred days, which um, I, I lament a little bit because it seems to be a derivation of uh, Franklin Roosevelt coming to office and then a habit yes. that has been uh, adopted by many presidents since then. We do have a question and I want to remind um, all of you, thank you so much for, for listening and participating so actively as listeners. Um, the first questions come in. If you have a question, please type it in the queue. Um, and Michael and Hedy Houston uh, asked George, so then why didn't Hoover just close the banks when he could? That's a good question. And I'm not sure at this point that I have a satisfactory answer. And if you don't have a good answer, then nobody does. Well, well, I hope to find an answer uh, as I write this up. Uh, and incidentally, this, this uh, project that you alluded to at the beginning, this is a kind of a, a, a segment of a larger study that I'm working to complete on the Hoover-Roosevelt relationship, which predated and postdated the banking crisis. But right now I'm focusing on the banking crisis. Hoover, I think, was afraid that um, if he did it, Congress would object and repudiate it immediately. So he basically, I think, wanted Roosevelt to kind of agree that Congress wouldn't do that. And uh, that was one factor. I also wonder whether Hoover felt that uh, what would be a, 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 a statesmanlike act to try to close the banks before everything just gets chaotic, whether that would go down in history as the last desperate proof of his failure. So why would he want to go out of office? The last thing he does is to close every bank in the United States. What he wanted to do was, I think, to, um, to close some of them and uh, limit foreign withdrawals. Uh, but uh, the, and also he was, had constitutional squ uh, squ uh, qualms about it, uh, as I alluded to. It was unclear whether the president had authority under the existing law to close all the banks. And his own attorney general said, I don't think you do. Well, Roosevelt's attorney general came in and said, I think you do. And so Roosevelt ran with it and people accepted it and so forth. Uh, it, was, it was something obscure. It was called the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917, which forbade sending gold to our enemies like Germany in World War I. But the law had never been repealed. So there's this all this scratching of the heads, you know, of the of the, among the chattering uh, class as well. Does he or doesn't he have the power to base his decision on on that uh, obscure and never uh, repealed law? Well, Roosevelt took that initiative. I think Rose Hoover hesitated because he had constitutional scruples, hesitated because he wasn't quite sure that anything quite that drastic was ne necessary, and maybe hesitated also because he thought this is sort of a self-indictment to go out unless I have everyone agreeing that this is the noble and proper thing to do. And he wanted Roosevelt to kind of cooperate with him, make a joint statement, and Roosevelt refused. And maybe he thought so much the better for Roosevelt if he did that. So. Um, so, so that's your that's what you suspect, right. but you're still you're still working on it. So we'll look forward to your forthcoming work about uh, yeah. the the Hoover and the extended FDR and Hoover. I also parenthetically, I, I I can't wait to. I want to know everything about that meeting between them on November twenty second, in it, including whether or not they had a drink in violation of the eighteen. Well, uh, I, from what I've read, um, Roosevelt smoked a cigarette and Hoover smoked a cigar. I don't Still think about alcoholic beverages. In fact, I know someone wrote up, you know, that uh, it was ginger, uh, orange juice or something like that. Hoover Just wouldn't have broken the law. He no, only no. he only would drink on uh, foreign proper foreign territory, which included the Belgian embassy. Listen, so for the first hundred days, we're we're getting close to the end here. But it turns out there was much more to discuss and to unpack in the in the context of the history of presidential transitions than in the first hundred days, because the first hundred days is really something that that happened when FDR uh, came into practice. It's, it's actually a communication, it's become a communications tool of the modern presidency in a way of, of organizing uh, political momentum for an mm -hmm. incoming president. Um, most recently, you know, majority uh, whip Jim Clyburn suggested that uh, you know, the articles of impeachment should be held in the House of Representatives right now and not sent over to the Senate until Biden, President Biden has a chance to complete his first 100 days in office and to uh, have his cabinet inaugurate uh, all sworn in. Um, of course, 
Biden has said that in his first 100 days, he plans to vaccinate 100 million people. He wants to get vaccinations up to a million people per day. So this, this idea of the first 100 days, George and John, um, I love your sense just in the context of from Roosevelt until now, um, how has it developed and, and gained steam as a communications tool? Well, I'll, I'll just say something briefly. I'm sure John had some comments here too. Uh, it was an accident. Uh, Hoover, I mean, Roosevelt initially wasn't planning to call an emergency session, but when the outgoing lame duck Congress basically stalemated on all sorts of issues, uh, then it became necessary. So the early days were devoted to um, passing the Economy Act of 33, which was cutting federal spending to balance the budget and straightening out the bank situation. And then Roosevelt had a long list of things that were much more liberal, you know, progressive, so to speak, uh, of agricultural reform, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and so on. And they just ticked them off and kept going, going, going. And then uh, the Congress adjourned, and lo and behold, it was something like the 100th day. And so it was not someone planning it that way, but it worked that way. And then, to use John's word again, it became the template for judging future presidents. Of course, it was a crisis moment, and not all presidents enter in that kind of mood of the country, but it's become something that historians and political scientists like to do when they judge other presidents against this, this uh, extraordinary period of congressional uh, achievement and presidential leadership. Yeah, I, I think not, not just a, a communications benchmark, but a measure of, of, of use of political capital, um, because I think it's become uh, fairly accepted that presidents have the most political capital when they come in before the prospect of the midterm start, you know, adjusting people's judgment. And, and it's sort of the, let's put forward your biggest items. But, you know, uh, obviously not all presidents ha have, have, have approached it that way. JFK warned that the actions of his administration in his inaugural address would not be completed in the first 100 days. Um, LBJ, obviously, assuming the presidency in, in less than ideal circumstances, but did use that template because he really measured himself as a legislature against what the Great Deal had done, naming his effort the Great Society. And then more recently, Bill Clinton and, and Barack Obama explicitly invoking uh, 100-day goals. And, and uh, I think Joe Biden is of that mindset as well. Yes, that's right. So are there any other questions um, from the audience for our panelists or about um, either the transitions about Hoover and FDR or um, the first hundred days and uh, are the, where we find ourselves in the first day um, in these uh, extraordinary times? And if there aren't, please go ahead and raise your hand or throw it in the queue. Um, and then I'll just conclude with I, you know, as we wrap up, we're going to be, we have about five more minutes left. Oh, Jerry, do you have a question? I just saw a question pop in. We do. Well, we have a question. Oh, there, there is a question that has popped up. Uh, do presidents typically, Deline, do presidents typically complete their goals for the first hundred days? Good question. George, do you want to take a stab at that one? Well, I would say probably, uh, to be literally, uh, to answer you literally, no. Uh, otherwise, what would they do for the next two? <laughs> yeah, and so forth. But they, they try to have some major achievement. For Reagan in 81, it was the, the economic reform tax cutting package, uh, to take one example. So um, they, they try to have some signature achievement. Uh, I think Democrats are probably more willing than Republicans to set up 100 days as a a kind of a model or a mystique and so forth. But um, Trump, Trump, when he went in January 17, started changing things on, on immigration, for example, as we remember. So there is a, a kind of a predisposition for presidents to be very active. And now it looks like uh, executive orders will be a, a kind of a new form of presidential activity or a renewed form, if you wish. Uh, I don't recall that Hoover did that much. It wasn't, uh, it was, executive orders were not uh, things that caught the news very much. Uh, here's a small little tidbit for you. I discovered, I'm looking into this just a day or so ago, that Herbert Hoover uh, pardoned more people than any other first one-term president. Hmm. 1400. I don't know there was a single con uh, you know, uh, controversial case among them. I'm not aware of any scholarly writing on that matter. These are probably mostly low level cases for some reason or other. But uh, Roosevelt by far gave the most, but that's because he was there the longest. 
uh, but Hoover is up there. And uh, somebody out there perhaps should research this, uh, just what was Hoover's policy on pardons. As I say, I'm not aware of any particular controversy uh, about them. Uh, and yet Hoover did it. I, I, my hunch is that because he was a Quaker background and he believed in penal reform that had been a policy that he had promoted early in his presidency, that he may have seen this as a way to um, bring justice using the, the pardoning power in individual cases. But, uh, anyway. We do have a couple more questions. Um, what comments do you have about the press's treatment during transition? How did the press cover the the media and the and the press? Well, I would say that the Hoover's press became increasingly uh, uh, critical. That is the White House press corps and so forth, and there was. Uh, increasing acrimony. Uh, I won't try to take time going into the the what this ha how this happened, but my sense is that during the interregnum, the transition period, um, Hoover was defeated. Uh, it was known that he was going to leave office. So I don't sense that the, there was press there was difficulty with the press as he had with leaks and and uh, stories that uh, seemed to be uh, malicious in character and so on during. Uh, say 1931 and 32, but for the, that particular period, the transition, uh, I, I don't think so. I think Hoover had, if not his own 100 days, he had an active early period as president. He called a special session of Congress for agricultural relief in April of 29. And I went back and looked at a few things happening there. And Hoover, I think, was getting a pretty good press early on because he was this activist, uh, visionary president and we had been through the quietude of Coolidge and now people were ready for a different style. Uh, so Hoover's press was initially good, but for a lot of reasons it deteriorated, but I don't think it was particularly better or worse, probably just more workmanlike during that transitional period. So that would be my answer. And maybe um, you want to elaborate in, on later presidents or whatever. And we have, we have one minute. Jerry, do we have time for one more question? I think, uh, may I, well, let's have this be the last question. Last question, super quick answer. Um, and John Avalon, do you want to take it? Who did the most during their first 100 days? And who did the worst? Well, I, I don't want to say I've got the definitive answer, but I think, you know, obviously a necessary condition is super majorities in Congress or extraordinary events. And I'd say probably most folks would say LBJ or FDR. Um, and, and who did the worst? I mean, you'd probably have or to- Or by that you mean who did the least? Who did the least, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think you'd probably have to look to cases of, of divided uh, government in the, in the beginning of a first term. Um, and while dividing governments become more dysfunctional over time, I don't know exactly what case that would be. George might. I can't think of any case. Remember, the, the president is, is the central figure, <clears throat> pardon me, in our political system is, is more of a 20th century phenomenon. I mean, many of the late 19th century presidents are remembered more for presiding than for having some great initiatives. So right. the idea that presidents would undertake initiatives is really a, a 20th century phenomenon. So uh, it might be unfair to some 19th century presidents that didn't do much in their first 100 days. Why are you so unfair to Benjamin Harrison? That's what I want to know. <laughs> yes. We only count the first 100 days from FDR on, as, we, as, as, as we've established. It didn't exist before That's then. right. Um, <laughs> George, thank you so much for your time. It's always wonderful to talk and, to you. And John Avalon, thank you for your time. I know you're very busy here with me, <laughs> with doing all the things we do together, yes. like work and be parents. And have our children, yes. And have our children, as you can see, who are watching with um, my mother-in-law, their grandmother, writing in the chat function on the side here. So We say um, hi to them, too, and thank, all of you. Thank you all uh, very much for joining us. And Jerry, thank you for having us. And George, for your expertise on Herbert Hoover, and John Avalon, for your expertise on, on Washington and Lincoln and the, and the American presidency. What, what oh, Margaret, is Margaret, John, and George, just th thank you so much. This has been a, a terrific presentation. Um, and of course, we'd like to thank the Library Museum and the site for helping out on that. As you look behind me, you can see the, uh, the front of the library. I would like to tell you that uh, it is green grass right now, but there, it's a little wider out there. So um, uh, we'll, hopefully we can get that melded. Uh, again, um, thank you so much. Um, one reminder I would have is the, the Hoover Presidential Foundation, sta Foundation staff is always here and ready to assist you with any of your membership needs or if you've got any charitable gifts in support of our causes at the Hoover campus, you know, just call or email us with any needs that you may have. And again, don't forget to register for tonight's third Thursday program titled The Origins. 
of the presidential cabinet and it begins at 6 p.m and the links are now open on our website and facebook pages and on behalf of the hoover campus we'd like to thank you for joining us and look forward to your next visit here at the hoover campus have a great afternoon and hopefully we'll talk to you this evening